are watching Faith World TV. Faith World TV, changing the world with the Word of God. Hi, my name's Rob Wall and I'm founder and director at The Reach Ministries. And today I want to talk to you about the subject, the theme of uniqueness. I believe there's a trait of humanity that's become a little bit of an endangered species. We have this trait that I believe is so pivotal, so important, so essential, and yet is often overlooked and undervalued, and that is uniqueness. We have been created by an amazing creator to have a unique impact on the world in which we live. However, let's be candid, let's be honest, we live in a cultural context that verbally celebrates uniqueness, but then visibly persecutes those who don't conform to our standards. And I believe in a very real sense, it's a strategic attempt of the enemy to suffocate and to minimize our impact because God only anoints the authentic self. God only anoints the authentic self. In other words, the only person God is going to help you to be is you. And when you're not you and when you try and be someone else or when you try and do what others try to put on you, you turn up for battles that you're meant to win, but you lose because you're turning up to the fight dressed as somebody else. And I really believe because we don't metaphorically take off the expectations of others, because we don't metaphorically take off the demands and the needs to please that we find ourselves wrestling with within, there are Goliaths that we've been assigned to fight in our culture that we never beat because we're turning up for the battle dressed as somebody else. And the hard thing is people are scared of difference. Eventually they warm to it, but essentially at first people are intimidated, they're scared by anything that they're not used to. But let me promise you this, though people accept what is the same, eventually they learn to respect what's different. And I found a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 17 that really corroborates my claim. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38, and it really speaks into this whole area of uniqueness. And it says this in 1 Samuel 38, that Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on David and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastened his sword over the tunic and he tried walking around because he was not used to it. But this is what I think is so courageous and brave and bold of David. He says, I cannot go in these, King Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And that's my clause of concern over the next few minutes. I want to speak to you from this subject. Take it off. And I want to ask you, do you have the courage to take off something that doesn't fit you? Do you have the courage to abandon your armor and to say to someone, be it a Saul, someone in a position of authority over you, do you have the courage to say, I can't wear this and I need to take it off? Can you take it off? Do you have the confidence to step out of the normal? Do you have the confidence to step out of the ordinary and to step into the extraordinary and to be absolutely, unequivocally, undeniably everything God has called you to be? Because God's looking for you. He's not looking for a clone. God's looking for you. He's not looking for a copy of your parents. God's looking for you, not your friend, because he's uniquely wired you to be you. He's uniquely wired you to defeat some giants in your culture, in your community, in your world. And some of the culture isn't falling because we're turning up for a fight that's meant to be built for you and I and our authentic self to defeat. But because we're so focused on what others are putting on us, we're not taking it off. And so inevitably and ultimately, we're losing the battle that we're meant to fight. Can you take it off knowing with confidence that people are going to criticize you? 
Can you take it off knowing that you can enter the door of culture and the way you live is different to the way they expect you to live and you're trying to live by the word of God but culture says this book is written by man alone and is not inspired by Jesus himself and so how can you live with a book that people say is no longer relevant and yet trying to be obedient in the midst of a society that doesn't value the very thing that validates the life through which you decide to live by? Can you take it off? Because if you can take it off, then you'll walk differently. If you can take it off, you'll tweet differently. If you can take it off, you'll text differently, you'll party differently, you'll speak differently. But when you know you have a calling, when you know you're called by God, you know you have to walk differently. But the problem is when you have a unique calling on your life, you're not going to find other people that are like you. You're not going to find a blueprint. You're not going to find a template by which to walk through because pioneers suffer the most pain. It's lonely to do something that no one's done before. And I used to really wrestle in my own life why I had a love for academic study and yet at the same time I had a love to pr love for preaching to the individual that's never walked into church before. I felt like a bit of a hybrid. How can I be one and the other? And there was no model for me to explore what this meant. There was no avenue for me to pass by to ask the questions, how do I develop this thing that I believe has been placed inside of me and deposited within me? How do I actually live out what I believe I've been called to live by? And because no one had done it before, I used to think that was an anomaly when actually it's the most unique thing about me. And what's it for you? Because there's this principle that I like in Exodus 34.10. I call it the Exodus 34.10 principle. Genius, I know. And it says, the Lord said, I'm making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do ne wonders never done before in any nation. Sometimes you've got a calling on your life to do something that's never been done before. And it's incredibly lonely because you're meant to set the way. You're meant to set the path. You're the person that's going to step out and launch into the unknown. And just because you're going to get opposition doesn't mean that you should conform to where wearing the armor that everybody else is telling you to wear. Because the danger is we can get so scared about stepping out and living by the standards imposed upon us by other people that eventually we forfeit the promise and the calling placed upon our lives because we had more confidence in the person who was giving us the armor than having confidence in stepping out in faith and taking off the armor. And so my question for you today is, can you take it off? Do you have the courage to take off the opinions of others? Do you have the courage to take off your parents' desire for you to always live near them because it's good for them and they don't want to be lonely in their old age and so you don't step out in faith and go to the places God wants you to go to because you want to make sure that you're pleasing the very people that created you quite literally? Can you take off the demands and the expectations that were never meant to be upon you but you found yourself in a position where you have to conform to those standards because you never had the heart to take off Saul's armor. And in this passage, what we have is David having the courage and the confidence to say to the king of the time, I can't wear this. But we only land in 1 Samuel chapter 17 because we're introduced to David in 1 Samuel 16. And we're only introduced to David in 1 Samuel 16 because the king of the time, King Saul, has a misdemeanor and is disobedient in 1 Samuel 15. If we catch the context, so to speak, what we find is King Saul has been given a mandate and a command by God. And yet Saul decides to disobey the God who created him and who blessed him. And so what arrogance essentially is, and that's what disobedience is, it's a form of arrogance that we believe our way is greater than the way presented before us by God in the scriptures and by his spirit. Samuel is told that he has to anoint another king because in 1 Samuel 15, Saul is disobedient and it's arrogance. And arrogance is just insecurity playing dress up. Arrogance is you believing your way is the way. And so Samuel has to anoint another king because Saul has had much better focus and much better clarity and much better confidence in the blesser rather than 
what he was initially called and set forth to do. And so what we find is David's anointed and he's put the rubbed with anointing oil and he goes back into the field. And one day David's dad says, David, I need you to take some cheese sandwiches to your brothers who are fighting on the battle lines because the Philistine army had been intimidating the Israelites for quite some time. And the Philistine army had one particular gentleman, a giant by the name of Goliath, a nine foot Philistine who wouldn't budge and who was intimidating everyone. And David turns up to the battle lines and he sees what's going on and he says, why is no one fighting this uncircumcised Philistine? Why are we allowing, why are we allowing this giant to defile the God that created us and the God who delivered us out of Egypt all those years ago? And so David approaches Saul, the king of the time, and David says, look, Saul, I can fight this Philistine giant. And he's rebuked and he's criticized by his brothers. But Saul says, OK, you go for it. But let me put on my armor and let me put it on you. Essentially, he's saying the way I fight and what I fight with is the way to get the victory. Does that sound familiar to you? Tradition, as wonderful it is, remembering where we've come from and it has everything to do with where we are now and where we're going. When you have more confidence in tradition than the trajectory where God wants to take you, when you don't have the confidence to say that was great, but it's time to aspire and to pioneer and to do a new thing when you don't have the confidence to take it off, you'll end up saying, yes, Saul, yes, Saul, let me try on your armor. And he starts walking around in Saul's armor and it just doesn't fit. Have you ever been in a situation and it just doesn't fit? Yes, you'd be great for that role. You've got lots of skills. Your acumen is fantastic. Why don't you take up this position? And then you say yes to the position, even though you knew it wasn't part of your calling. And now when the pressure's on and when people are complaining and when the teams are in disarray and when the teams aren't meeting standards and targets, you're walking around clunky in an armor you were never meant to wear because you didn't have the confidence to take it off and to say no. But David had the confidence. Saul hands him this armor. This is the way you win. It's my sword, custom designed for me, King Saul. And David tries it and he goes, as flash as this is, as wonderful as this is. I've been practicing in private with five stones from the brook and, and this little slingshot. It's wonderful that you have this heavy army and you have this shield that will protect and defend you and this sword that will slash and beat and advance against your enemy. But you don't understand in private, I defeated the lion and in private, I defeated the bear. And so if I'm going to beat this uncircumcised Philistine and honor the God of angel armies, what I'm going to need to do is wear what I'm comfortable in. And for me to be dressed in what I'm comfortable in, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to take off that armor. I know you you're the king and all, and I know it looked great on you, but quite frankly, for me to fulfill my calling, I have to feel comfortable. For me to sustain the blessing that God's going to give me as a result of me beating this uncircumcised Philistine, I have to do it in my own armor. And my own armor is pretty bare. My own armor is pretty stripped off. I've got this slingshot and I've got this rock, but the great thing is Goliath's weaponry was only good when it was in close combat. When someone was close to Goliath, he could use his sword and he could use his shield. But if someone was at a distance like David was, there was no way it was going to help Goliath. And so David was a genius. David decides to keep his distance. He stays back. He picks his moment. And of course, because he had the courage and the confidence to use the giftings that he was competent in and that he developed in private, he had the perfect aim and he had the perfect place and the perfect posture and the perfect position to know if he hits a part of Goliath that's not been protected by armor, then he's going to knock the guy down. But it all starts with knowing that victory initially comes by getting yourself in a state of vulnerability because all eyes were on David. His brothers are questioning his motives. Who do you think you are to come up against someone that we have not been able to defeat for weeks and weeks and weeks? 
Who do you think you are to say to Saul, who's more experienced, who's older, who's more competent? Who do you think you are to say, actually, I have more confidence in the gifts I've developed in private than the gifts that have been developed in public by our king? Who are you to say that you can take it off? But when you've been in a secret place like David had been, when you've seen God do enough things in private, it gives you confidence to say in public, yes, that worked for you, but this isn't going to work for me. It's time for me to take it off. I remember preaching at a church I once was a part of and I finished preaching and as part of the protocol after preaching you'd be taken into a back room invited to sit down and they'd give you feedback on your sermon before you then went to deliver the message again with the feedback that had been presented to you kind of woven into the fabric of the sermon you were about to present for the second time. And when this sermon feedback came to me, I was quite shocked because I was expecting, you know, three good points and then three points to develop for the next sermon. But this individual, this was my line manager, they embraced me with this thought. They said, you're too Pentecostal. You're preaching with too much passion. You need to listen to a few more English speakers and then you'll be toned down. Then you'll be a bit more sophisticated. And it was in that moment I realized that this individual was not focused on pulling out of me what had been deposited within me. It was trying to push me into acclimatizing to a culture that had always been the way it had been. And just because God's blessing was on this particular ministry, it was assumed that me being a part of that ministry was going to be predicated on me conforming to the way that they'd always done what they'd always done but I knew that in private I'd been memorizing preachers sermons word for word I knew in private that I had a calling on my life to preach to nations that's not arrogance that's affirmation from the heavenly father and the God that is within me saying this is what I've called you to on your own you're inadequate but with me I can do all things and all things are possible immeasurably more than you can ever ask think or indeed imagine and so I'd be pacing the walls and pacing the floors and just pacing the heavens everywhere I would go in private I'd be trying to memorize scriptures and so there was stuff in me that I had to get out in public because I'd been revealed it in private and unfortunately this sermon feedback was them saying we do not value what's been deposited within you because in the very moment that you bring those words out we feel that it's not appropriate and I with humility I hope and with honor had to make a decision And in that moment, I realized this individual had become so focused on the style that they'd completely overlooked the substance. And so I wiped my feet, so to speak, metaphorically. And I followed and forged the path God had called me to walk on. But if I hadn't have taken it off, if I'd have decided to go away from what I felt called to do, if I'd have diluted my style to appease and to be affirmed by the person who is, so to speak, marking my sermon. And let's be honest, how do you value a sermon? Some people love humour. Other people love intellectual revelation. Other people like a rhema word that's just going to hit them in the heart and hit them in the mind and change their lives. How do you measure what a good sermon is anyway? And I realised that I had a decision to make, to dilute who I was to please somebody else or to trust God and to literally take it off. Will people misunderstand you when you take it off? Absolutely. Will people test and question your motives? Certainly. But there are Goliaths in my life that would never fall down. People that would never be reached If I hadn't decided in that moment, I'm going to be different. Don't be different for difference sake. That's just being, quite frankly, silly. But but when you know you've got a calling on your life, that's not something to be embarrassed by. That's not something to play down. You've got to walk in confidence with something. And I'd rather walk in confidence with calling, acclaimed and accredited by my Heavenly Father, than diluting who I am to fit into a culture that I was meant to pass through, but not to count out in. And there are moments like today, opportunities, circumstances, situations that I would never be experiencing if I hadn't have taken it off. 
What do you need to take off today? For David, it was the armor and the approval of Saul. He had to take off any validation that he'd want from his brothers who never affirmed him anyway throughout his life. He needed to take off anything that was going to stop him from slinging that sling and putting those rocks in that slingshot. And it comes at a cost. I decided that I would leave my denomination after being in it for 10 years. All my contemporaries, all my colleagues, all the people I've ever looked up to were a part of this denomination. I had a mentor for many years. I really hoped I would one day be a bishop and they had such high hopes for me. And oftentimes it's the people that love you the most that they don't mean to to present this to you, but they kind of have an idea of what they think you should do based on the investment that they placed within you. And this one mentor was so keen I would work my way up this denomination if that was the Lord's will for my life. And I had to disappoint point and I had to be faced with the situation. Am I going to take off Saul's armor? Am I going to allow myself to go down a path, a trajectory that was never designed for me, but was focused on helping someone else? Will, will I be bold enough to take it off? And I woke up March the 1st, two years ago, in my mother-in-law's spare bedroom, I'd given up my job, my salary. I'd given up my beautiful three-bedroom house in the middle of central London, all on the words that God was going to use us to not just impact a small area, as great as that is, but to not just focus on a small parameter, but to be more outward focused, to have local roots, but to have a global reach. And so we took this step of faith. And I had hundreds of letters of abuse, loads of attack, loads of misunderstanding, even people high up thinking that what I'd done was a sin and wrong and not something that I should be proud of, but something that I should take back, almost like the prodigal coming back. But I knew that I've been called to take it off. And the biggest decision some of us will ever have to make is are we going to have the courage and the confidence to live out the conviction and to act on a conviction that has been placed upon our hearts. Don't get me wrong and don't mishear me. This is the disclaimer. Saul's armour wasn't a bad thing. Saul's armour worked for Saul. Saul defeated many enemies with the armour that had been placed upon him with the sword that was placed in his tunic and defended himself with the shield that had been put in his hands. And there's nothing wrong with a calling that other people are living out that they want you to live out yourself. But it only becomes a problem when you conform to it and you surrender to it, when you are never designed to live with it and you're meant to live a life that God has designed and called uniquely for you. And I wonder if you're dumbing out and dumbing down your distinctives because of a fear of what people will think about you. But can I say, people will stop Judging people will stop questioning the motives when they see the fruit of your decisions. Take it off. Abandon the armor. Say like David said to Saul, I can't wear this. And my slingshot might not look like much to you, but it's potent enough to defeat this uncircumcised Philistine. Take it off. What would that look like for you? Which conversations would you have to have to be able to determine to actually take that step and to live as someone that's uniquely called and has distinctives and is different and has a calling that's going to impact so many people that's incumbent and dependent upon you deciding, I am not going to wear this. What Goliath needs to come down in you? What callings yet to be accomplished because it's just waiting on you to make one small decision. Can I reiterate, God's promises aren't proportional. One small act doesn't mean you'll get one small reward back. And I'm not saying that by taking a step, you'll um, instinctively receive a blessing. But what I am saying, God is true to his promises. He is a faithful God. And though it looks like the seed you sow in the ground is dead, it's actually buried and it will come forth in his time. So small acts aren't proportional to what you'll get on the other side. Small acts actually end up reaping a huge, brilliant, big 
harvest, but it begins by you taking it off and deciding that I can't wear this. My prayer for us today, if you're watching this at home, if you're watching this online, is that we will have the resolve, the courage, the confidence, the clarity of mind, the nimbleness of thought to be able to approach our Goliaths as our authentic self, to take off anything that's not a part of who we are meant to be. And oftentimes, let me say this, the parts that we imitate rather than be inspired by, the parts of others that we imitate, we end up looking silly in them. We end up looking at their strengths and they end up looking like weaknesses upon us because God only anoints the authentic self. And it is an endangered species to live as anointed and appointed as one who's confident in accomplishing their assignment with just five rocks and a slingshot. But because you're confident in what you've been given, it will only take one rock and your Goliath will come down. May I encourage you, take it off. God bless you. watching Faith World TV. Faith World TV, changing the world with the Word of God.